Joseph. Joseph won't have it. He wouldn't want to break that relationship with his master and more importantly with God. And then he is falsely accused and thrown in prison. And that's where we left off. Chapter 39, verse 20. So Joseph's master took him and put him in jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. Things seem to go poorly for Joseph consistently. Right? But verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. It's an important word, kindness. It's chesed in Hebrew. Extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The jailer, the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. That sounds familiar, right? Do you remember? This is actually word for word almost exactly the same as what the text says about Joseph and Potiphar's house. Remember the beginning of chapter 39 when it said that God blessed Joseph and Potiphar didn't concern himself with anything in his house except for the food that he ate, right? Same thing here. Chief jailer, God blesses Joseph. Chief jailer doesn't concern himself with anything. He's, he's, on top of ev- or he's in charge of everything. There's only one difference between these two, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's significant, sorry. And it is the word that I mentioned earlier, chesed, but God extended his kindness to Joseph. God extended his kindness to Joseph in the midst of this very dark period. That's what the narrator reminds us of. We'll talk about it later. So then, chapter 40. Then it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord. It's the same word for sin. They sinned against their lord. They offended him. They did something wrong. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, so he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, wink, wink. We, we know somebody else who's there. In the jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, right? Remember, he's blessing everything that he does. God is. And he took care of them. Joseph took care of them. And they were in confinement for some time. We'll find out later it was actually a very long time when we see how old Joseph is when he finally meets Pharaoh. So then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, this is verse 5, both had a dream the same night, each man with his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, or look, they were dejected. He asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, why are your faces sad today? It's kind of curious, isn't it? Joseph betrayed, I can only imagine the emotional and psychological damage he went through being sold into slavery by his own family. And then falsely accused and thrown in prison is actually concerned about the welfare of his fellow prisoners. (laughs) It's almost a strange question, isn't it? Why are you downcast today? Well, we're in prison, Joseph. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But Joseph cares about them. He cares about them. I think that's really a testament to his character. And then they said to him, we've had a dream, and there's no one to interpret it. And then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me. Now, dream interpretation back then was practically a science. They had all these methods and rituals and whatnot for interpreting dreams. It was, I mean, it was akin to, you know, going to the doctor. It was something that was very normal. If you have this dream, you go see an interpreter, right? But they are bereft of access to a dream interpreter. They know that they both had significant dreams, they're concerned, but they don't have an interpreter. It's like, maybe I have appendicitis, but I can't get, go to a doctor. I've had this dream, I can't go see an interpreter. It was the normal thing. And then Joseph, interestingly, Joseph says, do not interpretations belong to God. He's not a professional. They had professional dream interpreters, but Joseph just says, interpretations belong to God. Tell it to me. Let's see what he says. And it's interesting that Joseph defers everything to God. Right? If you, think about, if you think about where he's at, if you think about where he's at, how he's gotten there, he's been betrayed, lied about, sold, you name it. That's where he's at. And that's the system that's been governing his life. Right? And yet he doesn't try and like make himself look good here. He doesn't try and like gain some status, gain some authority. He's just like, interpretations belong to God. And we're going to see that throughout the chapter. This is the first place. So the chief cupbearer starts. Told him his dream... Verse 9, he told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, look, there was a vine in front of me. 
and on the vine were three branches, and as it was budding, its blossoms came out, and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes, I squeezed them into the cup, and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it, just boom, like that. This is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head, pay attention to that word, lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Right? You're gonna be restored. Congratulations, that's what your dream means. Things are going well for you. And then, assured that his interpretation is right, Joseph interjects and begs the cupbearer to help him. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness, same word, please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. Joseph is asking this guy to show some sort of loyalty, some sort of right relationship. That's what that word kindness, chesed, we talk about it a lot. That's what it means, this faithful, loyal relationship, right? If you're a good friend, then you treat people with chesed. You know, it's the rightness of it. And he's like, please do me this kindness. I have just helped you. Please get me out of here. I mean, you can hear the pain in his voice, right? Again, betrayed by his family, sold as a slave, falsely accused and thrown in prison. Please show me kindness. Please let something go right for me. Please. And then he, we get his account. We get Joseph's account of what happened to him. For I, in fact, was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that they should have put me into this pit. It's interesting that he doesn't mention his family. I, I'm assuming it's probably because it was just too painful for him to admit to the strangers. My family betrayed me and sold me into slavery. I have done nothing that they should put me into this pit. His choice of words there is indicative of how he sees his circumstance. Remember when his brothers betrayed him, they threw him into a pit, right? And here he's in a prison, but he doesn't call it a prison. There's a word for prison. He calls it a pit. I'm back at the bottom. I am back at the bottom. Please help me. So then the chief baker, standing on the side, saw that he had interpreted favorably. Joseph did. He said to Joseph, it's verse 16, I also saw in my dream, and behold, Hey, maybe I'm going to get a good answer. I saw in my dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. And in the top basket, there were some of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Now, I'm not a professional dream interpreter, and neither are you, but I feel like um, scavenger birds eating something out of your head is a bad sign. It's a bad sign. But the baker's like, well, hey, it was good for this guy. Maybe it's going to be good for me. And then Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you. <laughs> it's a play on words there. Remember, lift up your head for the cupbearer. Lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat your flesh off you. Back then, this was, uh, so this is obviously bad news, but it's even worse than it sounds. Um, the, <laughs> the word for hang on, hanging on a tree, it's, it, you know, we, we think of people being executed by hanging. Um, but actually, what they, they would kill them and then impale them on a stake. Very graphic, but this is what they did. Impale them on a stake. That, that's really what it means as an example. You know, it wasn't just about the execution. Pharaoh made an example of the baker as the birds ate its flesh. Don't do what that guy did, everybody. And it was, I, I imagine, a compelling image. Um, thus, it came about on the third day. Okay, so let's see if Joseph was right. Thus, it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday. It's the only time in the Hebrew Bible that you see the word for birthday. It's really interesting. <laughs> that and a dollar will buy you a Coke. Um, that he made, sorry, that he made a feast for all his servants. Pharaoh's throwing a party for himself. And he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker. Remember, impaled, nasty just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Just as Joseph had interpreted to them. And remember Joseph's desperate cry to the cupbearer, please remember me. 
I know that you're going to be restored. God has revealed to me you're going to be restored. You're going to be next to the most powerful man in Egypt. Please, please, please remember me. Please. Everything he's been through in his life, please let something go right for me. Let something go right for me. But what happens? Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Forgot him. There is this cycle in Joseph's life, a cycle of bad things. It just seems to keep happening. First, his brothers are jealous of him. They hate him, and they sell him as a slave. Things start to look up in Potiphar's house. Boom, falsely accused of rape, sent back to jail. Finally, he has a chance to get an ear maybe with Pharaoh through the cupbearer. Forgotten. That's Joseph. Consider that despite being subjected, as we think about Joseph's life, as we think about what he's going through, as we think about what we could glean from this story, consider that despite being subjected again and again to betrayal, lies, deceit, tre treachery, or simply being abandoned in prison, whether by his family, his boss, we don't see Joseph giving into this paradigm, this attitude that, well, I guess that's how the world works, and himself trying to lie, cheat, and steal his way to the top. I mean, just imagine, after the deep pain and anger you'd feel being betrayed by your own brothers and sold as a slave, and maybe things are starting to look up. Things go well in Potiphar's house. You're trusted, in charge, succeeding. Then, bam, false accusations lies and you're back in prison, back in the pit, as he says, rotting in prison in Egypt. I think that would be an easy time if ever it happened in life, I think that would be an easy time to write off integrity, to write off God, to abuse his position of authority that he gained in prison, submit to that system of corruption, since it had mastered over his life ever since he was sold at 17. Remember, things just keep going badly because people are dishonest or forgetful or worse. But he doesn't. He doesn't. We see him maintain his integrity in chapter 39 when his boss's wife tries to seduce him. We see him having compassion on fellow prisoners, concern for their well-being. Joseph's circumstances didn't govern his faith. God was bigger than that. Joseph's circumstances didn't govern his faith. And it's amazing to think about what Joseph didn't know. What Joseph didn't know, what he didn't have the benefit of, which is the rest of Scripture as we do. We see many passages of many people suffering through God's will, prophets like Jeremiah, imprisoned for his commitment to God, apostles like Paul, shipwrecked, beaten, and stoned for his proclamation of the gospel, and even Jesus, the Son of God, crucified instead of crowned the rightful king. We have the benefit of looking back and taking comfort from these stories, these examples in scripture as we ourselves suffer. We can take courage when Paul says, we rejoice in our suffering knowing that suffering brings perseverance, perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We take courage and comfort from that because we know that we are not alone, that God's plan is bigger than our suffering. But Joseph was very, very alone. Again, betrayed by his family, falsely accused of rape, abandoned in prison. And do you know what accompanied him? This is, this is really interesting as we think about what we know versus what Joseph knows. What accompanied him in that loneliness was the theology of his day. The theology of that day was that when bad things happen to people, it's because they've sinned. That was the pervading thought of the day. God blesses good people, and bad people are judged. If you've ever read the book of Job, remember his three friends who come in, who come to him in his mourning after he's lost his house, his land, his family's been murdered. He's got nothing, right? And what do they do? They try and convince him that he must have done something wrong to deserve it and that he needs to appease God. Now, we know the text says Joseph had not, or, uh, Job had not done anything wrong. And that's why Job refused to listen to his friends. He's like, I have not done anything, right? But that was the theology of the day. Bad things are happening to you. You've done something bad. And so, too, Joseph, in his loneliness, 
These are the thoughts he was having to fight against as he sat in prison. Despite being betrayed, lied about, and probably wondering where God was in all of it, he had to fight through that even to maintain his integrity. Sleeping with Potiphar's wife would have been easy. I mean, imagine the psychological damage you have experienced if you've gone through what Joseph has gone through. I mean, humanize the story for a minute. Betrayed by your family and sold as a slave. But he didn't do it. He didn't cave. He said, no, he said instead to her, I fear God. And it got him a slew of racial slurs. Remember, she's like, that Hebrew this, false accusations, and it landed him in prison. Where would your faith be? Imagine the damage that you would carry emotionally and psychologically. It would be easy, very tempting to just say, to heck with it all, it's not worth it anymore. Joseph was very damaged, deeply scarred, and we're going to see that as he weeps again and again in the upcoming chapters. He weeps. There's a reason for that. And he was probably 18 years old, roughly, when his life and relationships entirely unraveled. 18. Yet we see in his life this resilience this ongoing allegiance to God. Joseph's pain didn't become an excuse to abandon God or his principles. God was bigger than that. And just as Joseph remained loyal to God, so God remained loyal to Joseph, right? Do you remember the beginning? We talked about that word chesed, the addition of it at the beginning. That was different than the original text on Potiphar's house. God's loyal love or loving kindness, despite all indications that the opposite was true, God was with Joseph in a very tangible sense. His covenant love, his commitment to Joseph, that's what this word kind of indicates, was very much alive. Joseph refused to abandon God in this section of his life, and God did not abandon him. And the narrator makes sure that we know that because we might be thinking the same thing that Job's friends had thought about Job. He deserved it. The narrator makes sure that we know that God was with him, that his plan was bigger simply than prosperity and judgment, the paradigm of the day. And as a side note, I guess we should really consider that it's actually more complicated than health and wealth creatures might indicate in some of their sermons. That's why the narrator makes sure to tell us that God was with him, even in prison. It's the two darkest moments of his life. Consider that. The two darkest moments of his life. After he sold into slavery, a slow death sentence, and the second one, when he's thrown in prison under false accusations, God was with him. And it's the only two times we see God mentioned by name in Joseph's entire story. There is in chapter 38, but that's about Judah. Everywhere else, you don't see God mentioned by name except for these two places. The darkest scenes in his life, God was with him. And those two realities for us just exist side by side. We don't get long explanations. It's just Joseph is in the darkest moment of his life. God was with him. God was with him. So the camera pans away from Joseph in chapter 40. We've we've gone through chapter 40. Now we're going to go through chapter 41. The camera pans now to Pharaoh, right? 41 verse 1. Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he was standing by the Nile. So Nile was a very fertile place. You're going to see a lot of fertility imagery here. That was very important to the Egyptians, right? And lo, or behold, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass, they were very fertile. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows, and then Pharaoh awoke. For those of you reading the Wing Feather Saga, I always picture the toothy cows. Um, he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Verse 5. And behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now in the morning, verse 8, now in the morning his spirit was troubled. Just like the baker, just like the cupbearer, now Pharaoh is a little disturbed by the dream. 
And it's because he recognized, like they did, this is a dream of significance. This wasn't just a weird experience. This means something, right? And as the head of the nation, something that means something to him has implications for his whole country, okay? He's concerned. He's rightly concerned. So he sent and called for the magicians of Egypt. Remember, interpreting dreams was a science. <laughs> so he got all the guys. He's like, you guys got to figure this out. And all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. No one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer, remember this is two years later. I said that at the beginning. Two years later, Joseph's been forgotten in prison. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh saying, I would make mention today of my own offenses. He's very deferential. And remember, Pharaoh was look, looked at like a god. He was considered a god. And so it's almost like, Talking to God and being like, hey, you remember that time I really screwed up? <laughs> I would make mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants. This is verse 10. And he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now a Hebrew, racial slur, now this Hebrew youth was with us there a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related them to him, the dreams that is, and he interpreted our dreams for us. Again, it was amazing that he could just do that without having to get some sort of like cow liver and look for markings on it. I'm serious, they would do stuff like that. He interpreted our dreams for us. To each one, he interpreted according to his own dream, and just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon, and when he, was sh when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh, right? So uh, in the Levant, they have beards, or in Israel, Syria, whatever, they had beards. In Egypt, they didn't have beards, so we had to get rid of the beard, right, if you're going to be presentable for Pharaoh. And they changed his clothes. And this is a really interesting thing that happens in the Joseph story. Something big always happens when he gets clothes, right? It's really interesting. First he gets the coat, makes his brothers jealous, and then the coat, and then he, and then he has these dreams, right, of like his, his family basically bowing down to him. Remember the, the wheat and then the sun and the moon and all that? So then that's what happens when he gets his coat. And then his, he, his brothers betray him, the coat is ripped off, torn, and bloodied, clothes. And then he comes back up in Potiphar's house, but what happens? Um, what's her name? She actually doesn't have a name. Uh, tries to seduce him, and then he runs away, and what's in her hand? And he's thrown in prison right after that. Isn't that interesting? And then here, he's about to be brought up out of prison, and he's shaven and given a change of clothes. It's like, it doesn't mean that this necessarily has like a lot of theological implications, but it's like good camera work in a film. The details here add theme to the story, and, and a certain beauty, I think, to the narrative. So he changed his clothes. He came to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it, and I've heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now, that's, that's specific. Remember, they had all these rituals, but Pharaoh's like, you can just hear them and interpret them. And then Joseph answered Pharaoh, and listen to what he says. Remember, remember how he pitched it to the cupbearer and the baker? Listen to how he pitches it to Pharaoh. It's not in me. God will give Pharaoh the answer that he seeks. Again, deferential language, more humility from Joseph, scarred, betrayed, beaten Joseph. He doesn't try and make himself look important to Pharaoh to impress him or save his own skin. That's amazing. I mean, to live a life of humility automatically acknowledges that our worth comes from somewhere else. And Joseph, despite everything he's been through, sees that his worth is from God. He doesn't have to aggrandize himself or boast about his abilities. He's like, well, it's not me, it's just God. Otherwise... If that weren't the case, we'd all have to go around all day boasting about ourselves and inflating our own reputations. Now, Joseph see, sees God's hand as much bigger. God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So Pharaoh spoke to Joseph. He describes the dream. He brings up the cows, right? There's these seven healthy cows, then these seven ugly cows. And it's funny. He's like, such as I had never seen for ugliness in all of the land of Egypt. <laughs> I did not know such ugly cows existed, Pharaoh says. And then the, the, the ugly cows, such as I had never seen in Egypt, they, they eat the fat cows. 
But then they look just as skinny as before, right? Kind of skimming through this part. Then he, he describes the second dream. Seven ears of, of grain, probably wheat, full and good, and then seven bad ears withered and scorched. They, they sprouted up after them, and then they swallowed the seven good ears. I told it to the magicians. Again, he's dumbfounded. I told it to the magici- magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Now Joseph says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. Here comes the interpretation. God has told, not I am telling you, Pharaoh. God has told Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven cows and the seven ears are each seven years. The dreams are one and the same. Seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. The seven thin ears scorched by the east wind are also seven years. It will be seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance, verse 29, are coming in all the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will come. And all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine will ravage the land. So the abundance will be unknown because, this, because of the subsequent famine. It's going to be that bad. Okay? It will be very severe. Now, as for repeating the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God. And God will quickly bring it about. Problem. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And then, verses 33 through 36, Pharaoh, uh, Joseph gives Pharaoh advice. Advice based on what's going on. And pay attention to how he says it again. Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food in those good years that are coming, store them and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Let them become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so that no one will die, essentially, right? So Joseph's like, Pharaoh, 20% tax, store it. I think it's funny that it says guard it. Like, hey, it matters that it stays there. Um, And then you're going to make it. Egypt's going to make it. That's it. You got to find somebody who's going to do that for you, Pharaoh. He doesn't say, me, 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 me. He says, here's my advice. Now, look at how much I've suffered. I deserve this. Joseph sees himself squarely in God's hands, even in front of Pharaoh. Remember how desperately he, he'd been waiting for this when he, when he asked the cupbearer, please remember me, please remember me, but still squarely in God's hands. That's where he sees himself. Now, this proposal, verse 37, seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his servants, Then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? Some translations probably say spirit of God. And if it has a capital G, um, that's interesting. I think divine spirit is probably better. This isn't Pharaoh converting to monotheism. He's just affirming with Joseph that this interpretation was divine, not of Joseph's making. So can we find a man like this in whom there's a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there's no one discerning There's no one as discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my royal estate. And according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh said, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace around his neck. Now, it it wasn't just like a necklace that we buy at a pawn shop. Like the golden collars, you seen those? On Egyptian statues sometime? This thing like covered your upper chest. It was that much gold. It was a huge deal. He had him ride in his second chariot, and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee, and set him over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh reiterates to Joseph, though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Imagine the whirlwind that Joseph just went through. From literally the same day, he was a slave imprisoned in a pit. Abandoned, forgotten. And now he is the viceroy over one of the greatest nations in the world at the time. Excuse me. And it gets better. He gets a wife. Verse 45. 
Pharaoh named Joseph Zephanath Paneah, and he gave him Asenath, the daughter of the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. So Joseph gets married into the Egyptian aristocracy. It's a permanent position. And he went forth over the land of Egypt. Um, and then the story goes on that he did everything that he said. He exacted the 20% tax. He stored the grains. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, verse 49, like the sand of the sea, until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. Now, now before the years of the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of Elm, bore to him. Joseph named the first one Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and my father's household. He named the second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Again, picture the journey Joseph has just been on. He's gone from slave to prisoner to viceroy of Egypt and member of the aristocracy. And he names one son looking back and one son looking forward. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. All my father's household, these people who betrayed me, I've, I'm going to forget them now. He's ready to leave that chapter behind. He named the second one Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The land of my affliction, God has made me fruitful. And he looked forward. And he looked forward. He wanted to forget everything about his family and what they'd done to him. But... What's next in the story is perhaps Joseph's greatest test. And his very personal and individual story that we've seen, or that we've been hearing since his betrayal is about to be woven into the greater story of God's chosen family, one of the main subjects of the book of Genesis. That family, that family that betrayed him is now under threat, right? They're, they're liable to starve because the famine's coming. It's under threat which means that the promise of God is under threat as well. Remember, God promised Abraham land, people, and blessing in Genesis 12 and 15. You can't have any of that if the chosen family starves to death. And here we find Joseph, viceroy of Egypt, abounding with food, yet by that very family, betrayed, ripped of privilege, sold as a slave, but now with complete power over them to do as he pleases. Because they're, they're going to be coming to Egypt. We'll talk about this in two weeks. They're going to come to Egypt in search of grain. He'll see them. And now he's in complete power to do with, them, with, to do with them whatever he wants. We've seen him review, refuse to abuse his position in the past, namely with Potiphar's wife. But now, now that he has complete control over what happens to his brother, what will his response be? We'll see in a few weeks. But suffice it to say, that the picture is a lot thicker than just they reconciled. There's a lot that happens. There's a lot that happens. And Joseph is ready, as we saw in this naming passage. Remember, naming stuff, whenever you see it in the Old Testament, it's very important. And he's ready, based on this naming passage, to forget everything about them, to forget everything about them because of how deeply they have wounded him. But he's not going to be able to because they're going to show up right in his face. And we're going to see what happens. And so we've transitioned kind of in conclusion, to make sense of this story so far. We've transitioned out of the suffering portion of Joseph's life, chapters 37 through 41, um, into the Joseph Viceroy of Egypt portion of his life. But before we move on, before we just jump straight to that, consider the journey that he's been on. Stay there before we see him in the part of the story that's easier to swallow. His success, right? It's easy to root for that part. Before that, though, before that success, that position, that authority, he was betrayed by his brothers, enslaved, imprisoned, and forgotten. Twelve years. Twelve years. Look at verse 46. Now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 30 years old is how old he is now that all this stuff is happening. And when he started this journey, he was 17, maybe 18. So 12, 13 years, more than a decade, more than a decade he suffered, was a slave, lied about, rotted in prison. And sitting next to all that is God's plan to use him to save the chosen family, the descendants of Abraham, who are at risk of starving. And the, and the echoes of the narrator, they're next to that too. God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. It's not easy for us when we're suffering, really suffering, 
who are on the receiving end of injustice to sense God's presence. We don't know how much Joseph did either. We don't. Remember, the narrator is telling us that God was with Joseph. That's privileged information for the audience, right? It doesn't say Joseph woke up in prison and was like, hey, God, good morning. So glad that you're comforting me through all this. I mean, if you look at how Joseph described what happened to him, remember when he told the cupbearer and the beggar, like, Here, here's what happened to me. He doesn't seem too encouraged. He doesn't seem too encouraged. And yet there it is. God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. And we can, maybe, as we consider our own feelings of God's absence, that he's distant, maybe. And maybe it's felt that way for a long time. Perhaps we hear as well in the narrator's affirmation of God's presence, Jesus' words as he left his disciples, behold, I am with you always even unto the end of the age, even to the very end. I am with you always. I am with you always. Despite everything he'd been through, and the psychological and emotional damage his experience caused him, despite that, Joseph maintained his faith in God. His allegiance to God didn't waver, even though he had every excuse for it to. He really did. And consider this, that God didn't even speak to him. Remember how he spoke to Abraham verbally and Jacob? He swore oaths to them. He instructed them. He comforted them. He encouraged them when they were on the brink. Remember when Jacob was meeting Esau, he was terrified. He thought Esau was going to murder him and his whole family. And in that moment, God spoke to him and comforted him directly, verbally. Reminded him of his promise. Joseph had surely heard these stories from Jacob, his father, I mean, he was his favorite son, too. And about Abraham, his great-grandfather. But God was suspiciously silent in his own life. Twelve years. Except for sending him a pair of dreams that ended up with him being betrayed by his brothers out of jealousy. Despite that, Joseph maintained his integrity, his allegiance to God, who was behind the scenes and continued to move in his life and work through him toward the purpose he had for Joseph, the salvation of his entire family, which eventually meant the birth of a nation, Israel. Integrity through suffering. Righteousness is another word for it, doing the right. Doing the right. Remember how easy it would have been for Joseph to slip. As I considered Joseph's radical integrity through suffering, I thought of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., how much he endured in his fight for racial equality, resolute and under firm conviction by God, but eventually dying for the cause, not seeing the final fruit of his hard work, but what a legacy he left. How very much did God use his life and his suffering? And we, too, can maintain integrity through suffering. We can hear scripture speak, but God was with Joseph. We can feel the Holy Spirit breathe in our hearts, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even when our suffering does not make sense, there's not always an answer, when there's not this obvious reason for what we're going through, when the night is the darkest. Remember, two times it says it, and it was at the darkest moments of his life. When the night is the darkest, through more than a decade of suffering, God was with. Joseph. And for that long and more, for us, he will be with us. Through Jesus, he made a covenant with us. Remember that word, chesed. It's like a covenant. Through Jesus, he made a covenant with us, not just Abraham's family, but for anyone who accepts Jesus. I am with you always. And we can take courage that he is with us. We can press into him in prayer when we don't understand, when we're being treated unfairly, when prejudice rears its ugly head, Joseph experienced all these things. We have access to God through Jesus. We're part of that chosen family now too. Jesus made it possible. And like Joseph, we can suffer with integrity, not abandon our righteousness, and take comfort from his example and from Jesus' words, I will never leave you. Remember what the narrator told us at the very beginning. God showed Joseph kindness, chesed. 
loyalty. God showed him loyalty. And through Jesus, we experience that loyalty. We, too, call God our Father. And his loyalty and his kindness and his love extend to us, to you, to me. Even if we can't feel it, even if we don't see it like Joseph didn't 12 years. God has sworn himself to us. And as we suffer, let us do it with integrity, not abandoning, not abandoning hope but living in righteousness, trusting God's hand in our lives and not forgetting his love and his loyalty to us. Now, as we take communion together, that's us remembering how Jesus made that possible, his death on our behalf so that we could have new life in God. And then next week we'll celebrate his resurrection, our new life, and our redemption.